Good evening. Welcome to the special school committee meeting, uh, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, May 3rd at 7 p.m. I would like to call the meeting to order and begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. And Ms. Biagioni Smith, if you would lead us, that would be great. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And our announcement for the evening. The May 3rd, 2022 Special School Committee meeting will be recorded and will be posted on the district's website at the conclusion of the four interviews for superintendent. Under the open meeting law, the public is permitted to make an audio or video recording of an open session at a public meeting. At this time, I would ask if anyone is recording tonight's meeting to please identify themselves. And seeing no one, we're gonna move forward. And we have with us tonight, um, Ms. Brenda Thoreau Regan, and welcome. It's um, a pleasure to have you here. I realize it's been probably a long day in the district, <laughs> yes. um, kind of in a different role today, um, but we appreciate you taking the time, meeting with our staff, our students, our community members, um, and we've appreciated you uh, being here. So uh, we each have two questions for you tonight. Uh, we have 75 minutes total for the entire interview, and um, there'll be an opportunity for an opening and ending statement. So um, if you'd like to start with an opening statement, I would. First of all, Madam Chair, thank you very much and members of the committee for having me here tonight. It's my proud honor to be in front of you and to tell you a little bit about myself and then to share some of my uh, skills and experiences as a school leader and as a district leader um, during this finalist portion of the superintendent interview process. Uh, first of all, let me just tell you, I'm a proud member of this Tewksbury community. Um, my family has very deep roots here in Tewksbury, all pun intended. You probably don't know this, but my family has been in the town since the 1770s as floral farmers and contributed to the status of Tewksbury being the carnation capital of the world for many years. I'm proud to tell you that. I'm proud to have, ha have those roots here in Tewksbury. I can tell you I grew up here myself learning the hard work ethic it took to be uh, the daughter of a farmer and um, certainly no um, stranger to hard work. But um, I received my amazing education here in Tewksbury Public Schools as well. And that gave me all the opportunities and advantages that I needed in pursuing my own educational career. Um, my husband and I, after moving away for a short time, came back and built our own home here in Tewksbury. My husband, Peter, of 33 years. We have two grown children, Casey and Alana, both who also went through the Tewksbury Public School System quite proudly and had amazing experiences that helped them to shape and um, participate in their own life career um, uh, opportunities. So I'm very proud to be here with you tonight and I'd like to do something a little bit unorthodox and if you will indulge me, I wanna share with you just my thinking and rather than revisiting my entire resume which you have in my entrance letter and those reference letters, I wanna share with you a draft of an entry plan, a draft of an entry plan that I have some insight for having served um, as a district leader for eight years and most recently as your interim superintendent and assistant superintendent. Um, this is a draft because it's right now my draft. This draft won't be complete until I've had the opportunity, obviously, to meet with the stakeholders of Tewksbury. But I'm gonna draw you first to page two because it's important that you understand what my core values are as an educator and as a leader, and that is the motivation that I reach for when leading vision planning or decision making in our school district. First and foremost, every decision I make is what is in the best interest of students. That guides me every time, whether it's a small decision or a large decision. I believe a superintendent needs to be sincerely connected and truly care about the community he or she serves. That is my why my vastly different and unique perspective I bring to the role of district leader. Uh, this is much more than a job to me. It's certainly a labor of love. Our schools, I believe, need to be safe and welcoming where everyone feels they belong and they're valued. I believe all students and educators can and will learn and um, uh, be successful when we strive to provide the necessary supports, opportunities, and experiences that will help them see their opportunities in the future. Equally as important as decisions matter um, with students first is that relationships matter. Every relationship a school leader um, um, 
has needs to build strong, trusting, and collaborative relationships with the entire Tewksbury Public School community and our town leaders. Those small relationships and challenges will help us uh, provide um, solid working relationships when those difficult challenges uh, come our way. And then certainly building those strong support systems for our schools requires a thoughtful, fiscally responsible leader. So the purpose of this draft entry plan is for me to really share out with you uh, how I gain further insight into the needs and strengths of our school district. And certainly for me to really think through, the role of superintendent is far more uh, complex than any role I've served in thus far. So I know I have a lot of learning to do, and that begins with listening and conversing with all of the stakeholders of our district. So if you would turn to the page four, that begins with you, school committee. Um, the first step in this process really is to develop a clear communication plan with you. And Madam Chair, you and I have had this conversation slightly already in my short role as interim. How do you and I work together to communicate the needs of the committee, not only in setting those monthly agendas, but putting those topics and interests of the committee onto those agendas? How do we establish an emergency communication plan um, today on my way here to emergency calls come in. They come in at night, on weekends, on Sundays. You all have lives outside of this volunteer role, but we need to establish how do you want to hear from me in those events, and certainly how can I support you in responding to district uh, community members when they reach out to you around school or district issues. So in that communication plan also is a bevy, a constant uh, data collection process through open forums like we just had, through individual conversations, group conversations, surveys, and more with, and if you turn to the next page, the multitude of school district stakeholders. And that includes our committee, our parents, our students, especially our students, our staff, and then all of those town leaders and officials that you heard from when they came to talk to you about our current very productive working relationship. Some of the questions I would want to know and I'd want some input from, uh, while I know the district well, this is an opportunity for me to look at this district through a new lens, through my own unique leadership style, and ask the very questions, what are we most proud of in the Tewksbury Public Schools? What are the areas of greatest success and greatest need? What is the number one or two goals that we're really looking to achieve in the immediate um, timeline or in the near future, and then how, um, how do the stakeholders prefer? Communication is a key focus area for most groups that they would like uh, either more or less or different or um, I think knowing that our stakeholder groups uh, have different needs for communication, it's important to ask what's the best way to communicate the working of the district to them. There are many documents I've had a hand in actually producing, every one in that list. However, I'd like to revisit those documents with those varied stakeholder groups. For example, if I'm meeting with students, I'd like their input on how that student handbook is really meeting their needs. I don't want to come in with assumptions that we have all the answers. Clearly, again, as I said, this is my opportunity to look at our district through a clean lens and work with the stakeholders and the people who are attending our schools to see if these documents are meeting the needs that um, they have. There are four steps in this entry plan. I am not going to define out all four steps, but you can see after that lengthy process of um, an open forum and time to discuss and converse with multiple stakeholder groups in the TPS system, um, step two would be to do an analysis and then communicate out that uh, collected data. Step three would be some goal setting and planning together with the district. And then step four, a development of a plan to implement into the second year of uh, my leadership. Well, I mean, if you turn to page seven, I'm in the first two months of this leadership. And I want to, um, what I have here, and I know I've shared this with a couple of you in different ways um, just as I stepped into the role. There are many challenging tasks ahead of us just in the next two months. And I want to share some of those really large ones with you. Um, obviously, I've assumed the role of interim superintendent and assistant superintendent at the same time. People might not know out there that we are um, without an assistant superintendent right now or person doing both roles. We have relocated the central school offices over the to the Tewksbury Fire Station. It's one bullet 
and one you know, cross off on this list, but that was an enormous task done by an enormously um, successful team. I'm so lucky to have the team I have at Central Office. A lot of work, and we're successfully there without any interruption to the district. And in bold, because probably the most important task from now through the end of the school year and then beyond is the planning for the new center elementary school. These you know, few bullets represent uh, lots of hours in, in um, collaboration with multiple different groups planning for the school. I think that's the most exciting and um, you know, energizing task that I'm working on right now as your interim superintendent and can't wait to continue uh, all the way through the opening of the school. Um, you have heard through some of our meet and greets I've in implemented the monthly, or re-implemented I should say, the monthly principal meetings with in instructional walkthroughs, with meetings with the staff to talk about their celebrations and challenges in the school and just reopen that collaborative discussion with our teachers. I have, um, instead of weekly district leadership team meetings, I've taken that to bi-weekly meetings. So our principals have some um, additional time to be in those classrooms and working with the teachers. I've reestablished our district newsletter as a uh, concise way of communicating some of the work going on in the district. Um, you've heard about our ELA textbook program and pilot, and I'll save that later a little bit towards what the vision and the look ahead is for some of the big tasks in the district, but also supporting our new school committee members. Um, you need to know, and I know we've, we've um, talked and have been together through some of the tours of our school, I'm here to support you as well. I've continued with my regional networking with Merrimack Valley school superintendents and assistant superintendents. They were in front of you last week to share those experiences with me as a district leader. I was proud to have them here. Um, you can see that we've crossed off the school year 22-23 budget. That is a lengthy process that starts last year and moves us into working together with our school leaders, our finance committee. Thank you, Mr. Russo. Um, when you changed hats, you were there when we first proposed our budget. But then after um, coming to agreement on our town budget with the town manager and the finance committee, we go to town meeting and last night we successfully um, um, were approved of our next year's school budget. Two very important regulatory uh, processes that are happening are our tiered focus monitoring and our comprehensive district review. Why are those important? This is when the state comes in and really takes a snapshot of how our district is doing and gives us the important feedback we need from their level to really move our district forward. This is a daunting task. This is consuming most of the time right now of our district leadership team and our school leaders. It is, while it's daunting, it's very valuable. Because as I said, we will get feedback on how to improve in areas of our strengths, which is equally important that we celebrate that with all of our staff. Because the evidence that goes into these audits comes from the classroom, comes from our procedures. Um, I will be completing by June 30th all of the summative evaluations on all of our district admin and principals, and then probably the piece that makes me most happy is participating in and attending all the end of year celebrations at all of our schools. I share with you uh, the many negotiations and ratifications that have happened since March 1st. So I'm proud to tell you we've closed five contracts in a month's time. We have two left to go, the Tewksbury Administrators Group and Food Service. We're also beginning this month our work with the Tewksbury Teachers Association on um, looking at and reviewing their Appendix B positions, our coaching and advisors. District hiring, you can see that there's many very important district administrative positions to hire. Um, you should be hearing more about that, those, those hirings in the next couple of weeks from me. But more importantly, if you look at that last bullet, new staff hiring. I don't know if you knew this, but every final interview of faculty and administrators and key staff in the district go through the, both the superintendent and the assistant superintendent. Ms. Johnson's here today and she knows scheduling all of those interviews in is so important that um, we at the district level meet and do that final interview. I can tell you that this is the most important role I serve as your district leader because hiring the strongest team of administrators and talented teachers is the single most important way I can support our schools and our students. 
So I share this draft plan with you so you can see just the level of planning and detail and organization that I put into the role. And I'm ready to put into the role from my vast experiences in Tewksbury. So I know you have plenty of questions for me. I kept it at 50 minutes, as I <laughs> promised. And then I hope to share a vision of moving into the future with you at the end. Okay. Thank you very much. Our first question is uh, from Mr. Sullivan. Great. Thank you, Mrs. Regan. Uh, and these questions, I believe, are right in front of you. So Thank you. Um, <clears throat> if you don't hear something or something isn't clear, uh, please feel free to clarify or, or uh, look at the sheet. Um, as you're aware, it's an ongoing goal here in Tewksbury to support our students in achieving to the best of their ability. In light of the past two years due to the pandemic and the academic and social regression we've seen, how would you support our students both socially and academically in reaching this goal and ensuring the best outcomes for all students? Absolutely. Um, couldn't agree more that this is one of the most single important goals of the district, and it is right now. Both the uh, acceleration uh, roadmap and providing strong social emotional support to all of our students. So um, I'll start with the SEL piece. If you don't mind, there's a lot of acronyms in education, so uh, stop me if I use an acronym that you're not sure what that means. But um, uh, right now, I mean, it starts with listening to our students. It really starts with hearing where are they at. Now with the older students, that's a little bit easier, right? We can provide them with surveys. We've brought in a new tool to do that, to really hear where do they need our help and support the most. Um, but with our younger students, we see it in behavior, right? We see it in behaviors and um, maybe the inability to focus and, and um, have attention or the inability to get along as well as they used to. Um, we have a lot of makeup to do. We are right now in the district not only using that same tool at K to 8 to, to just gauge where are their strengths and where are their needs, but what lessons can we provide when we know that. Um, so when we address the social emotional learning needs, we also know we need to address supports. We have um, school adjustment counselors at this point in all schools, um, interns in some one-year positions. We intend on bringing all of them back next year to support our students, but also to support our staff, because our staff needs the support to support their students. And um, so with social emotional learning, it's, um, you know, it's, it, it's the explicit instruction, it's listening to the students' needs, it's adjusting our practice based on those needs, and certainly celebrating the strengths. And um, some of the ways I'd like to participate in that as a district leader is um, implement a student advisory group to the superintendent. I want to hear from the students. I want our district office administrators to be part of those conversations. Um, the business manager, for example, he sees numbers. He sees dollars. He's not hearing these stories from our students and our staff. So when we can have those forums with students and really hear, you know, where are their needs at and how can we support them, then we can adjust our um, district vision better. Academically, uh, it, you know, it really kind of falls into the same realm. We know that we have to provide solid tier one or general instruction to every student, but we have to have those supports in place as well. Coaching is one of the um, supports we have been using very, very successfully in Tewksbury. Uh, our math coaches have been supporting our teachers and our students in the class. You know, we have to focus our uh, curriculum and our academic program now uh, and prioritize purposely, what's, what are we teaching in the class? We're not, we don't have the time to make up everything we think they miss. So how do we provide a, a quality tier one instruction with those supports when they need them? And some of those supports are some new resources and programs that I hope I have an opportunity to share with you later when I uh, share the vision of our, not only curriculum improvement, but uh, opportunities for students and staff. Great, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> And the next question is mine. Um, how have you or how do you plan to prioritize district needs for all faculty with relation to specialized training and workshops that are applicable to their role and help them meet the instructional needs for all students? Okay, so, so prioritizing the district needs starts with that district um, plan, the district goals. And that comes from a lot of data and a lot of um, Resources. So, our, our, um, as a school committee, you'll be 
uh, participating in our school retreat in the summer, and you'll see what the school's accomplishments were over the past school year and where their areas of needs are. And those needs are related to certain maybe academic data, social emotional data, uh, capital needs. So when we have the needs and we have goals that we set, then our professional development program, and I'm talking about the uh, formalized calendar program, supports that, those district goals. Um, but there are many ways that we support the needs for professionally developing our staff. So, and I assume that's what you mean when you say training workshops. Uh, through their PLC meetings, through their faculty meetings, through those coaches that come in and embed professional development into the day-to-day -day instruction, through our mentoring program. Um, and that's when our staff really tell us what it is they need. I also visualize um, re-implementing our teacher. Uh, we had a uh, superintendent teacher uh, <coughs> advisory group, and we met openly and honestly, and we worked on what are the needs of our teachers? What, what areas of training do you need us to bring to you? I also think it's important that we differentiate that training. You know, we say that in the classroom, and what we mean is, if we have these district goals, and let's just work on the first two that we talked about, social emotional learning, and um, you know that acceleration roadmap around academics, you know perhaps we have choice within those district goals with multiple levels of training. And I talked about that with a group of teachers today because you, you, some of our staff are expert, you know, in let's say delivering social emotional learning lessons to the whole group. They can help deliver that those workshops and training to their, uh, to their groups or choose some other workshop we have related to the district goals if they feel that's not the training I really need right now. So I think um, it starts with our district plan. It starts with the entry plan and listening and finding out what people feel we need. I can also tell you at the end of every school year, like an exit survey, we ask all of our staff uh, including our um, support staff, to give us their feedback on what it is they need for further professional development. And they give us areas of need. So um, I can go on a long time about this. I can also tell you we look at our um, growth model. It's, it's called the evaluation tool, but it's really a growth model. And we look at where are the areas our staff uh, need the most growth. So we use that tool. We use the survey. Um, we look at evaluations of PD over the past year and see some that were really successful. People give us feedback so that we know how to move forward with that. Um, but it really does, it does start with asking and then providing strong consultants and, and um, resources for our staff to uh, Thank participate. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, Mr. Parsons, you have the next question. Thank you. So what have you done in your current district or past experience to make your special education department work better? How have you looked at ways to contain costs, and how have you balanced the needs of students with the fiscal responsibilities of the schools? Okay. Well, I think um, my current district here <laughs> and my past experience, I mean, it goes 22 years back. I can tell you I am um, a proponent of inclusion. And as a teacher, um, I included I was on a special education team, and as a math teacher in middle school math, uh, it was not an easy feat to include all of our special education learners. But that's where differentiation comes in. Um, you look at access points to the, to the work. So inclusion, I'm going to stop there. I can talk about the years I was in teaching for a long time. Inclusion, that means training for our teachers and co-teaching. Because when you have two teachers in the room, and sometimes students are included into the general ed classroom, and sometimes there's a co-teaching component where the special education teacher and the general ed teacher are working together. So I have um, worked together with our special Rick Pelletier, um, and our special educators in training our teachers on the co-teaching model. We've worked with some of the world's most renowned consultants in that area, West Ed, and they really elevated our teachers' practice and how to co-teach when you have multiple abilities in the room. Um, I think that is a way of containing costs. You know, I, I mean, every student we're successfully teaching within the district is containing costs. By bringing in the right supports, um, for example, um, 
you know, reading instruction supports that meet the needs of our students that struggle with language, and by co-teaching and having those supports early and often, that helps to contain costs. You want to catch any of those um, struggles early. And when you can do that, uh, you know, and hopefully help, help a child succeed in the earlier level, we're going to be containing costs later as they uh, proceed through our, um, our school district. And how I, have I balanced the needs of students with fiscal responsibilities of schools? Well, right now our responsibility is to our students' needs. And it is, um, we know that it, it, we need more social emotional support. We need more school adjustment counselors. We need more behavior specialists. We need the, um, I talked with some teachers today, we need more developmental learning centers. Some of our students are truly struggling and having a hard time maintaining time in the general ed classroom all day. They need that transition space. So, you know, the needs of the students come first, and we're right now utilizing our grant dollars because the uh, ESSER grant dollars we have support filling in those learning loss needs and those um, social emotional learning needs of our students. We will continue to seek out all, every available dollar to bring those supports because we know, again, if we bring the school adjustment counselors, for example, we're also helping the classroom teacher meet the needs of students. So um, I hope I've answered all parts of that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and next is Ms. Bia Jones Smith. <laughs> Hello. All right, so um, you are proposing a highly controversial program. The school committee or your staff is seemingly divided on this issue and a group has formed to oppose the program. You strongly believe that this new program will be highly beneficial to the students. What steps would you take in this scenario to ensure proper communication of this? Okay. Well, if I strongly believe that the program will be highly beneficial to students, it, I, I'm hoping that it's meeting a need. You know, there, there has to be a need. Um, we, I typically, as a leader, don't go looking for a program. I look, for, I look to meet a need that we see in our uh, student you know, um, achievement needs, or potentially maybe it's even a, a communication tool. But there's a need. So I'm thinking if there <coughs> is a uh, resistance or a division on the issue, there's probably something lost in communication. Maybe people don't know, why are we looking at this? What is the need? What will this do? Um, the division on the issue or the program could be a need for more support. It could be that people um, are feeling anxious you know, about using something new. So I think the key again there is that open communication and the listening to why are we divided on the issue. You know, is it, is it a lack of knowing? Is it a lack of support? Is it that it's not working? Because that's true too. Sometimes we think something's going to be uh, a wonderful tool to fill a need that we have. And often that happens with a resource and it's not. Um, the best tool. We know that with our most current reading program. It doesn't fit the bill for everything. And even though some people love it, we know right now we need to seek out a resource that's better. Um, we get input into the resource first as well. So you do need buy-in. You do need people to be part of that decision. Um, some decisions are mandates, and that's a tough pill to swallow when you weren't part of it. We we deal with them all the time as, a, as district leaders, and then we do our best to bring people in to understand why we're doing it and how we're gonna do it together. So I think um, if we know where we're starting and where we wanna end, it's that how in between that we need to work out together so that people aren't divided on the actual issue. It's really you know how we get there. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, and uh, Mr. Russo. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, over the last couple of years, uh, a lot of polarizing views have emerged about parents having a say in their child's education. Uh, what are your feelings toward this specifically, and how will you work to ensure that parents are having their voices heard? Yeah, parents deserve to have their voices heard. Um, many of us at the table are parents of students that have gone through our schools, and you know we, we, we have opinions that absolutely deserve to be heard. So I would say this. Um, this reminds me of one of the questions on, in the first interview, and I'm um, really happy to hear it because um, we have a standards-based curriculum. That's a mandate. 
the town of Tewksbury has to follow the Massachusetts standards-based curriculum. However, not all parents are going to have the same views on resources or ways in which we teach that. And parents deserve to have their voice heard. Uh, if our goal, it's similar to the question before, if our goal is to get from you know, A to B, how we get there is least important, or what we always use as a resource as much as we are getting to that standard. And this will happen. I uh, use the example, I'll give you an example of an easy um, uh, specific on this, math. Every single year I taught math, and I think every math teacher hears that parents get frustrated with how to help their child with math because it's a new math. It's not the math they learned, and it's very frustrating. And they get very angry when they feel um, not confident or comfortable in helping their child. And it's our job to support them with that, right? So you have to have a conversation with the parent. You either have to help them understand why we do what we do, how to do it, or give them additional ways that make them more comfortable. Other ways and specifics, um, sex education. Right off the bat, that one comes to my head and we get challenged um, you know, with opposing views on how we have to teach that. And again, there are standards that we have to follow within our health curriculum for students at different age levels. But that's an opportunity to draw the parent in and, 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 and share the resources. Let them preview them. Let them perhaps even uh, have options to use to help their child with that standard or that information. So I think parents need to be part of the education process in that way. Um, it's always negotiable because we want parents comfortable with what that end result of that standard is. Not with, I mean, with all the tools we use in between, there are options, just like differentiating for a student, there are often times we have to differentiate for families, and I'm very comfortable as a leader helping families through that process. Great, thank you. Okay, and Mr. Sullivan. Great, thank you. How would you successfully collaborate with stakeholders in the school community to assure a successful opening of the new school and the combining of grades two through four? And what considerations would you apply to the process to minimize educational impact on our students? I'm wondering how much time we have. <laughs> um, this is a great question. This is, the, this is why I shared with you the most exciting work we're doing right now. And you know we've had a, a working group all through this piece. So we have our committee, obviously, on the new school. We have a website. We have all those ways we're pushing out information. But right now, it's really about meeting with all of the affected um, groups, whether it's parents, students, and our teachers. Our plan starts with a draft timeline. Ms. Garabedian and uh, Ms. Bijoni smith were able to attend our joint labor management meeting um, and see that timeline and now it's about communicating to parents and our staff, what does the rest of this year look like in that transition? What is the uh, six months or um, the summer through move in? What does that look like? What opportunities will there be for students to virtually visit that school until we get that occupancy permit? How do we get then field trips over there? Teachers to see their class, try their class out, the students to see where they'll be and what classroom they'll be in with their teacher. So there's so many ways that um, we want to get the school community and then the community at large uh, a visual into that school prior to our moving in. Also, we're walking, we're going school to school. Um, Jay Harding and myself bringing some of those materials and those um, material boards to get people really excited. A lot of choices have been made over the last uh, year, and we want people excited about them. We've had um, different, a, a couple of teachers involved in that. Um, it, throughout the last year, not as many involved as we have right now. It's getting very exciting, and we're happy to have them there. Um, so the, uh, minimizing the educational impact for students will, um, one key strategy we have is over the summer. So once we know who all the staff are, that's our job from now till June, who are all the staff that'll be going over there so they're in the right place. At the start of the school year, those staff members will have their class. Those class of students will move exactly over to that new school with that teacher. But that's not enough. What we're also going to do is build a schedule that the students will kick off with on day one. So for example, a third grade student at the North Street, North Street School will have the schedule in place on day one at the North Street School 
And that schedule will even move with that student when they transition over to the new school. So for example, if a student has ELA on blocks one and two, they're going to have ELA on blocks one and two when they go over to the new school. If they have art on block four, they'll have art on block four. If lunch is at a specific time, it will be at that time. We're gonna build in so many routines that follow the student over to the new school. So the transition's really about the new building. It's the place. And, and less about everything else. Their materials will be brought over. They'll have visited their class and know where their desk will be. We'll provide orientations. As I said, those field trips. We're continuously strategizing ways to ease that transition and really have everybody ready and excited. Um, there will be some anxiety, and we know that. I mean, it's, a, it, it, it's normal to be anxious and nervous to go into a new building, but we're trying to make it as familiar and routine as possible and then it'll be shiny and new when they get over there. <coughs> Great, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, the next question is mine. Uh, we have received lots of feedback on the wishes of many stakeholders to evaluate and improve on communication across the district. Can you speak to how you have or how you intend to be the, a leader that seeks input, processes, and communicates back to the community? Yeah, and actually, I mean, that's a great opportunity, too, for me to share with you, you, you know, some of my vision. Um, the last bullet, but certainly not the least or the least important is increased stakeholder voice in our uh, school program improvements. I know communication is and was um, and probably always will be a, a primary focus, right? People need to not only be heard but to um, a two-way communication. So I believe I'm in the best position to do that. Um, I understand uh, where we've been. I, I, I believe the vision of improving that opportunity, not only open forums, but establishing a student advisory to the superintendent, reestablishing our monthly teacher's advisory that had no agenda as much as what do we need you know, to discuss together. Professional development committees as part of that, or break-off committees as part of that uh, teacher forum. Uh, strengthening our PLC facilitator role. Our PLC facilitator, those are our teacher leaders within the school. Uh, they do that planning with, they're really the conduit back to the rest of the teachers in the group. Uh, monthly parent community meet and greets. Again, casual, open forums without an agenda, but regular routine opportunities for people to be part of uh, what's going on in the school. The district newsletter is a small step. I think, um, you know, there's the struggle that districts have in communicating out enough and not too much. I'd really like to explore a PR whether committee or entity to help the district continuously push out the information in the in the um, way that people want to hear it, whether it's you know Twitter. Our website's not enough. We know that. Our emails are not enough. The newsletter's not enough. But what's the right way? Once I talk with and meet with the differing stakeholder groups, how do they want to hear from us? So the the you know opportunity um, to be part of shaping the vision for communication is first, and then having multiple opportunities to have my ear and my, me to have theirs is key. So um, that that's something I truly miss. And as a opportunity as a district leader, a unique leader with my own skills and my own um, vision, that's what I'd like to implement. I think key for me, I miss having that student advisory. So as a superintendent, I, that really um, excites me, hearing from the students and communicating back with them. Because I think that they feel everything is said to them. And I need them to be partners with uh, the district in creating the programs and what they want. Their communication is most important, I would say, to me. Okay, thank you. Sure. And Mr. Parsons? Thank you. <clears throat> so these past couple of years have taken a toll on our school community. Several relationships between different stakeholder groups are strained. The argument can be made that these less than ideal relationships do have an impact on our family, students, educators, school staff, and residents. How will you restore relationships between stakeholder groups around the common goal of providing the best education for students possible? You know, um, as you heard my core values, relationships matter. And it starts with every single conversation that we have. Um, I, something so important to me as a community member 
as an educational leader, a teacher, someone who um, is out and about, is that every conversation I have and with whoever the stakeholder group is has to be respectful and kind, um, with trust, mutual respect, and I believe that's what I bring to the table when I meet with people. Um, people always will remember how you made them feel in the end. They will. And even through difficult situations, or little, small, and happy situations, celebrations, uh, people always remember how you make them feel. It will be my goal to make sure that the stakeholders in this community <coughs> know that those relationships matter so much to me. I, I, I never want to walk away thinking that I left anyone feeling badly, even when the message was difficult, maybe, that we still had um, a respectful and caring conversation. And every parent, and I know you heard from many uh, that came and talked to you, expressed how I have a skill in doing that, and I, and I know I've had a proven practice in building very strong relationships with all stakeholder groups, and you're right, from teachers to the aides to our town manager to our chief of police to uh, fellow superintendents, students. I mean, the most proud moment is when those students walked in and talked to you and told you about the interactions we have are there um, opportunities that have been great here. So I think it's about relationships again, Nick. I really do. I think um, we have to build trust, and teachers have to believe that I trust them, and I do, um, and that I believe every single day they're coming here to do the best for students. So sadly, yes, that strain took its toll on our students, and I know that. And um, in our meet and greet, we talked a little bit about that. I counseled many a student and many a teacher who had difficulty through that time who called me personally um, and asked for my help. And I believe that is a trusting relationship. We got through it, but right now, we ha I have to be very, very mindful to continue to make sure our relationships um, are trusting and honest and open. And I'm, I'm making that effort every day with being in the building, with having these types of forums, and with um, you know writing letters of recommendations for students every time they ask, but being there and knowing they can count on me. Um, and when the times get tough, I think we can get through it together if we continue to have that sense that we want to. Okay, and Ms. Bia Joni Smith. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, what role do you believe that the staff should play in decision making? How have you involved your staff in decision in the decision making process? Okay. Um, well, as a district leader, right, there's multiple ways you make decisions, and I'm going to throw two off the table right away. You know, when you just make a decision, that doesn't happen that often unless it's, you know, in a very emergency crisis, it's now, say, uh, and then there's you don't make a decision. You know, you, you, you let it go. Um, those two don't happen that often. The two ways that you do make decisions very often, one is a you know, democratic process where everyone has a, a say and then we go with the uh, majority. But the most often way a district leader or any leader for that made, matter uh, makes a decision is by hearing the input of the multiple stakeholders, drawing them into the conversation. Sometimes you have a lengthy period of time and sometimes a short period of time. But you need to hear, um, for example, our district leadership team meetings. Um, we're always talking and collaborating about how we're going to make this decision. It might be a small one, from morning recess to a larger one. Um, you know, the pandemic, we were constantly faced with making decisions. But it's through the process of hearing everybody out and hearing all of that input before um, a decision is made. So people have to be invited to the table to uh, have that input prior to decision making. Inevitably, a, a leader has to make a decision. But you have to get the input from all of the people involved, or at least as many as possible, um, to do that. So involved in staff decision making process, um, a curriculum resource. You know, we have staff all the time uh, give us or try and give us their feedback using rubrics and processes, discussions. Sometimes those things go on for a whole year where the staff ultimately are giving you the, the feedback on what we might use in the next year. Um, there's, again, there's a rubric and a process. Sometimes cost comes into play, but generally we have people try it on, 
bump it around and uh, see if it's the best resource for students. So multiple ways in which we draw them in. Again, having those forums are, it, things don't always need to be so formalized. You know, whether it's pick up the phone and ask, you know, talk with people, I have them call me, and, and also revisiting the decision. Because sometimes, you know, with all the best efforts, a decision is made and it may not, um, there's fallout and there's repercussions. So you need to bring back people and talk about that and say, how do we um, adapt? You know, from the technical piece to the decision to the adaptive piece and the responsive piece. Mm -hmm. That's all key in uh, considering what a decision and the impact it has on others. Sure. Okay, the final formal question is from Mr. Russo. Great, thank you. Well, um, seems fitting since last night our town budget, uh, our school budget was approved at our town meeting. But um, with property tax going up every year approximately 2.5% and over 60% of those funds going <coughs> towards our schools, how will you ensure that the budget you are putting forward takes into account the level of services that Tewksbury residents in many cases have come to expect, <laughs> as well as ensuring a budget that focuses on student achievement? Okay. Um, well, the budget process is, um, it is complex, but it really is a, uh, a process. We look at our spending from year to year. We uh, ask our, we, we look at our needs, first of all. I mean, sometimes needs come about that you are not expecting, especially in the area of uh, the supports and um, related service support staff we've needed this year that was not uh, thoroughly expected. But um, so we look at what the needs are for students first. Again, decisions should be made with students' best interests first. Now, with that said, we also have buildings to take care of, and we are very proud of the um, maintenance on our buildings. We have to look at those capital projects that are needed as well. So when we look at our budget, we prioritize staffing, we prioritize supports, we prioritize the resources our teachers and students need, and then we look at what, what absolute have-tos need to be done at our school to make sure that they're safe and sound. Um, our community expects that. We, you know, we look at the life ex example of our technology. We have a plan for out of our um, technology running its course. But if we are up against the wall, a teacher versus that technology, we may have to put that off for another year, right? We have a, a routine. We have, just like you budget um, uh, improvements at your home, you know, we are budgeting those things in our, our school budget. But um, we, once we have a budget, and we've vetted it through all of our principals and our staff because we ask our staff, what is it that you need? What is imperative that we have to have in a classroom? And sometimes it's, you know, <coughs> adaptive furniture because our students need bubble stools and they need stand-up desks and they need things like that to help them um, better learn in the class. And we look at all of those needs, then we go through the, okay, what can we pare down? We prioritize that budget and we we stay firm to what were the highest priority needs in all of our schools. When we have a total and we go to the town manager and the finance committee, uh, we have to defend what those priorities are. Sometimes, as I said, a, a, a school you know, building crisis might happen, like a roof, a need like that, and if we can't get those extra capital outlay dollars for a project like that, we have to start looking within our budget. But um, it's a long process. Yeah that goes through several iterations of what do we need, why do we need it, can we refine it and prioritize it, and then um, we have to defend it uh, at the committee level and with the town manager so that we get support. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we actually have um, a good amount of time here, um, 20, 25 minutes. So I'll open it up for some questions if anybody has any. I'll start with you, Mr. Parsons, any questions? <coughs> Me too. Um, so I just have to ask, just knowing your enthusiasm for the classroom, um, it's overwhelmingly clear that teaching and learning is your passion. Um, and I can just see the joy radiate off of you when you're talking about memories or past students or students now and your interactions with them. Um, the superintendent job isn't as student facing, so I, I have to ask. Um, you know, why do you want to leave that part of the job for the very important job of being a superintendent? 
That's a great question. Um, well, first of all, I think the superintendent's job does need to be that. And I know that the superintendent's job, don't get me wrong, is to clear the way, right, for our school leaders and our teachers and all the support staff to really do the work. We need to provide those resources and provide that opportunity. But I do think a superintendent's role is to be an instructional leader as well as setting a vision for what we want for students. And that begins with talking with students. I have a very unique opportunity. I have so many great relationships in this district with families and students and our staff that I believe that as a leader um, that's going to benefit me as a superintendent to, to create a vision that our district wants. And I say our district because I live here too. And I, I think I have a really good um, handle on at least um, how to have those relationships with our community so that we, so I can lead. And I know that it might feel traditional that a superintendent is not part of the um, relationship building in the district, but I think that the superintendent is the role model for having a strong, trusting, um, positive relationship so that people feel good about coming to work and feel good about doing the work they do with students. I believe I bring that positivity. I have, the enthousi I have enthusiasm all day long and energy for the work because I do love the work. Uh, I love the work here in Tewksbury. I believe the superintendency is the next step for me because of those 22 years of experience I've uh, had and brought to my students and to the staff here. You know, um, you have my resume in front of you, and, um, and it, I put my hand up to be part of every one of those committees and every one of those initiatives to benefit the students and the um, teachers and the community members here. I believe the next step for me is to do that, not because it's a title of superintendent, but because it's the work I love to do and I think that the role of superintendent being so connected to the town is imperative. It's more than a job and I think that that's um, something very unique I can bring to the role that I think this town needs. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Russo? Oh, nice. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, so. I think there's a, you know, living in town and uh, obviously being a part of this district, I think there's a, there's a population of folks out there, both employees within the district and also within the community, that feel it's maybe time for a change yeah. within leadership. I guess, bluntly, what would you say to them? <laughs> well, um, I am a change. I've been called a lot of words in my life, and one of them is change agent. Another is an engine, the engine that continues to keep this district moving forward. Another is an innovator. Um, I have a never-ending um, enthusiasm, if you will, for finding ways to forward our district. I um, have not been the superintendent. I don't think the, the, the um, community has seen me in this role yet. They know me in the roles I've been in. They've seen my leadership style. They know how much I care and I'm compassionate about the work I do for Tewksbury. As a leader, I will continue to bring that fresh look. I will continue to bring those changes when they're needed and when we're, um, you, you know, I, I want to inspire change, not make it happen, right? I want to inspire change in our teachers because they see the need, they see the desire, our community sees the need. It's about inspiring us to want to continue to improve. If I had the privilege of leading our district, I would be right in there rolling my sleeves up with every stakeholder group um, in prioritizing what those changes and what that fresh approach needs to look like, starting with and at the very top of the list are students and our very, very dedicated and talented teachers. So when people think something new is someone different, well, I just haven't had the opportunity to show them what I would bring to the leadership as superintendent. Um, Rich, people ask me all the time, why in the world would I want to be, and fill in the blank, a teacher in the town you live in, a principal in the town you live in, a you know, district leader in the town you live in, a superintendent in the town you live in, you have no peace and quiet or privacy. And that's not what I'm looking for. I don't drive away and say, oh, I'm leaving, you know, oh, go home and be alone. 
I love walking <coughs> in my neighborhood and having those conversations with my um, friends, neighbors, family. I have many senior citizen friends in this town and talking to them about what's going on in the schools. I need the committee to know I don't have my resume out in multiple communities. I'm not looking to do this work. I'm not looking for the title. I'm looking to continue the work that I've done over the past 22 years here in my town, in Tewksbury, our town. I'm not looking to do this anywhere else. So um, I am a fresh change. I am something different. And um, I believe I can bring that fresh, new perspective and the caring warmth that I believe our town deserves. Somebody that's here for them, um, I could go on a long time. I'm, I promise I won't sing a song. <laughs> I'll make you cry. But um, I believe I'm in the best position right now. There's the past. There's institutional history. One of the teachers that I've known now for three years said to me in our meet and greet, I didn't even know all of these things happened or exist in Tewksbury. I'm so glad I just had 45 minutes with you. I bring that past, all the positive. We never want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? We have so much to um, you know, feel great about. But it's also learning from the past that helps us be better leaders for the future. I hit the ground running and ready to do that. I need to heal right along with our staff and our town. We all went through that together. And I know that I'm the person to help them do that because no one cares more than I do about that. And I mean it, and I know you do, but I mean as a leader and a finalist that you're working with, I have a very unique perspective that nobody else has. And um, I believe we're a family, we're all in this together, and I'm here to keep doing the work with them. So. Thank you. I appreciate yeah, you're your, welcome. your candidness. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Smith. I have a question, um, and it goes back to the very first question one um, about student achievement. Yes. Um, we hear a lot about um, advanced placement in high school and yes. special ed needs, and um, what do you have to say and, and advise or um, plans for those in the middle, those ones that maybe sometimes people feel like they may get lost, um, challenging those kids that are somewhere in the middle at times. So I'm so glad you brought that up. And you're really kind of drawing me back to the vision statement because, um, and you had the opportunity to talk with me a bit about this up in the meet and greet. Um, there's nothing like applied learning, career expo exploration, providing opportunities for students. I'll give you an example of the STEM program that I um, was uh, you know, at, at the front champion for at our Ryan School. And you may have heard that two of our students, now this is a brand new program, right? But the idea is that students will look for real world problems and they'll learn through their STEM curriculum how to solve world problems. Um, and, and, and this is how you um, hook kids who, you know, kids have a, um, a vision of what academic learning means. I'm really either really good at it or I struggle at it or geez, I'm right down the middle. This is how we inspire learning. This is how we inspire all of our students is when we can apply a real world meaning to it. So if you look at just some of the visions I hope I have for those students and all of them is um, expanding on our dual enrollment program. Dual enrollment is when students are at our high school but taking a college level class that, that garners them a, a bona fide college transcript. We now have some of those courses at the high school here uh, through Middlesex Community College and we are looking to work with Southern New Hampshire University on some of their aerospace and computer technology and those um, transcripted college courses. That's what inspires a student to succeed, is when the learning's authentic, when it means something to them, and when they can see themselves as a confident college student, as a junior or a sophomore, and <coughs> a college transcript leaving high school, that's how they go on to succeed, you know, post-secondary uh, opportunities. But I would also say, when I talk to students what they want, they want more experiences in the arts. They want more finding performing arts courses. They want more STEM computer science and those applied learning opportunities. Um, service learning, that's another way to take a student who's less engaged in why they're learning or what they're learning to have a reason for learning. If you remember the water bottle service learning project at the Wynn, perfect example. You have students of multiple abilities working towards one service learning project. Service learning means we're gonna look at a community need and we're gonna um, try to work together as a team 
So it's basically the way teams work out, you know, in, out in the career world. We have a need, and we're going to look at meeting it. So some of you are going to take on letter writing. Some of you are going to be, be the research and developers. Some of you are going to come up with uh, the communication plan with district leaders. And what happened were students who struggled significantly with their literacy skills, writing, for example, had a purpose for the writing that was so meaningful that we watched those students just blossom in their writing achievement over that year. Students with disabilities, but were so attached to the reason for the learning. So when you say, how do you lift the students in the middle and provide opportunities, it, it's, in, it's in programs like that that I really um, am looking forward to building more of. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Okay. Mr. Sullivan, any questions? Great, yes. Um, actually, I would like to piggyback my uh, colleagues on the bookend of these tables. Wonderful questions. Um, like you, I think we have a unique uh, perspective, Nick and I and Bridget, no disrespect to our new members, where um, we've had the opportunity to work with you um, and stakeholders and be in the community. So um, I couldn't agree with my colleague to my right anymore about your passion and your enthusiasm. Um, and you talk about, and I think a lot of people don't understand it, the difference between being a superintendent and an assistant superintendent, and I think you alluded to it with uh, my colleague to, to my left about the vision. Yeah. So, you know, give me that 30,000 uh, foot vision. How will your vision differ from the past superintendent? And how do you see that vision taking what I feel is a good district to that next level to becoming an even better high quality district um, for us. Okay, so I've learned from so many amazing leaders in my past, I really have, and in my um, style, I mean, I, I, I really am uh, someone who responds well to reflecting on, you know, um, what I've learned through past leadership. My vision would, first of all, have to include, that's why this is a draft. What is the vision of the community? When I tell you I know that these things are needed, it's because I am connected to the community. I know where, we, where we're going. I know what teachers and parents and students are asking for. But my vision has to include more. It has to include, ultimately, Keith, opportunities. We have to give our kids more opportunities during the learning to apply what they're learning. And that comes in the way of, um, like I said, that service learning, those internships at an earlier level. We are, we are in need of bringing those career explorations to younger students. So my vision is how do we continue to provide experiences along with the academics that are really meaningful. That, my vision of um, bringing those things in and Listen, I'm going to keep championing to bring those in, regardless of what role I'm in. Um, but I believe the vision right there is what opportunities do parents and students need us to provide for their students. Um, and and as, a, as a leader, that's going to be my mantra. How do we bring those opportunities here? And I think, um, I don't know if that's different than um, past leaders of the district, um, but I have a passion for it, and I'm not going to stop until kids tell me, you know, there's nothing else I need. <laughs> uh, and, and when that happens, I, I, which I doubt will ever happen, uh, or parents tell me, there's nothing else we need, we have everything we want, because I know that there are, there are those needs. So my, my, um, my difference will be in how much I truly care about not failing. It's not a fight for me, it never will be, it's not a win or lose, it's about not failing. I, I, I can't fail, this is my community, and I won't. So I will work tirelessly to make sure I don't, and I think that is something, a person who lives and breathes with the members you walk by every day, your neighbors, um, takes to heart. And like I said, I love my town. And I would say I'm different in that way, that there's no way I'm going to want to or will fail because I, it means too much to me. Thank I'm you. not saying I won't make mistakes, <laughs> but I promise I won't fail on behalf of your kiddos or all of our staff. Thank you. Okay. And myself, actually, the question that I had kind of overlapped with um, one of the questions that was already asked, so I don't, I don't know that I want to... Um, take up your time with that because um, I think you answered my question pretty well 
Um, but you do have some time for closing remarks if you'd like to share anything else with us that we haven't yet asked about. Sure. Well, I just guess, let me fill in some of the blanks, right? What next for Tewksbury? We have some ongoing initiatives, um, but they also require vision. Where will we go with some of our academic needs? Where will we go with our SEL needs? Um, and I, I'll just start right there. You know, our highest priority right now is increased social emotional learning supports for our students and staff. You know, um, we see just the frustration and the fatigue, and we do see, I mean, I, we see very happy students. Don't get me wrong, it's really been a, um, a just a, a lighter and airier feeling this spring as you walk through schools. You see it. You see it in the student work everywhere. You see it in the collaboration. And um, I'm so happy to see that, but at the same time, we also see that people are tired. This has been a long road. Um, so we need to increase the supports for our staff. Right in our PD, for example, last PD, one of the first activities we did was we asked our staff, just get out in the building through the lens of a student. Walk through your school. It was a scavenger hunt, if you will, and again, I have a great uh, PD team that we've been working on this together. What do our staff need? They needed the opportunity to get out and look at what inspires you? What do you see in a classroom that makes it feel more welcoming than the next? Because when we say this is a priority, that we want to foster that sense of belonging and welcoming for everybody, what does it look like to a student? What does it feel like? Because I guarantee when you walk in a class, you feel it. Or maybe you don't. Walk through the front door of your school. What do you see? How do you feel? So we gave them that time to just scavenger hunt, get some sense of feeling good. And then, you know, reflect on that. How can we, if we say that's something we want to do, well, how might you um, adjust? But people were also getting really great feedback on how joyful they felt in this room or that room or that um, bulletin board. So it starts with really, um, the healing isn't just in our relationship, it's in that type of approach. It's also about, um, you know, when we talk about school adjustment counselors and guidance counselors and explicit programming, and um, we have to think about how do we provide opportunities for the big kids too, you know, because it's the big people that need to feel happy and um, refreshed throughout the school day. So as a te former teacher, certainly as a district leader, I know I need that too. We need joy and fun back in the school day. We had a gentleman stand up at school committee meeting and said, we need to be outside more. He's right. You know, we want that fresh air. Th those were some of the silver linings on mass breaks, which wasn't a pleasant thing, but getting outside a lot. So we want to continue. We want to continue with those good byproducts of what we lived through during a very challenging time. Um, one vision I have is expanding our peer mentoring. I think you heard from some of our high school students how happy they are to be part of peer leadership and peer mentoring. We like to bring that also down to the Ryan School. That is a wonderful opportunity when we have that campus to have our big kids at the Ryan be peer mentors to our little kids. Talk about easing the transition for our younger students and our parents when those little bit older students can be their leaders and helpers at times in the school day. So we'll be exploring that with the um, Ryan admin team. If you look at our academic program improvements, um, it's important that those math coach and ELA literacy coaches are there for our teachers because we're looking at uh, curriculum improvements, much needed curriculum improvements, and that's based on our student needs. You can see we're beginning with our youngest learners. We know we have to start there. They had the greatest learning loss in time out of school. That doesn't mean it's not important across the board, but we know if we build really strong approaches in our uh, K through four, math in our K through five and then six through eight ELA curriculum, then we're gonna build stronger learners all the way through. You may know we are bringing on and bringing back our elementary school libraries. So when we talk about getting excited and wrapping around the joy of reading, partnered with that new um, curriculum program, we're bringing in two elementary library media specialists along with aides that will support those libraries and work together with as many parent volunteers that want to stay on board. They have kept our libraries alive for years. We recognize the work they've done and we are certainly encouraging them to, to uh, apply for some of these jobs or at least stay on board and work with the people that um, will be opening our new library and, and uh, breathing new life into our doing in Heathbrook Library. 
I talked a little bit about our uh, course and program expansion. I'll be working very, very closely with the new high school principal <coughs> and our students just to really, what do they need? We know we need a stronger world language program in our younger grade levels, especially at our middle school. We know that program, as far as syllabi literacy and global competency, and then the AP uh, language abilities of our students are thwarted a little bit because we need that program to start a little younger. So the, the, the academic vision, it comes from our teachers, it comes from our students. These are needs that we see in the district. Uh, career exploration, that's the way to hook our kids. We have to give them, um, College is far too expensive to be making mistakes because you just don't know what that career feels like or looks like. The more opportunities we can bring into our grade levels, our middle school, and then our high school. The senior project's a fantastic culminating event, but we need to back that up now. How can we provide some of those experiences younger? And um, whether it's visits in the building, um, bringing in engineers, bringing in medical professionals, having those healthcare exploration um, opportunities, um, the innovative pathway grants, whenever you probably maybe don't know, we have students doing internships at Thermo Fisher. I mean, they are now, we have a, a second year um, Thermo Fisher intern getting a job as a senior for this summer. So talk about networking and providing opportunities. Um, I'm so excited about doing more of that. I would go on all day long about how excited I am about building program and vision as a, as a district leader because we'll take it back to the first smart board in this district. And you may have heard this story. Um, and I'm watching the clock, Ms. Garabiti. <laughs> I wanted um, a smart board so bad because it's wonderful technology. And this goes back many, many years. And I went to my superintendent at the time, Chris McGrath, and I asked her, can I apply for this grant? It was called the Connections Grant. And she said, and it was a $48,000 grant, and what it got me was a smart board, and at the time they were very expensive, um, and it got me the training to use the smart board in Calgary, Canada, at Smart Technologies. But that's not all I got. What I got was um, I had to commit to be a master trainer. I had to commit to provide a vision for smart board technology in our schools, and that wasn't all. I had to commit to connect with three other countries in seven other classrooms over a two-year period to take technology to connecting people around the world. So it was called the Connections Grant. So I got the grant, I went to Calgary, I got the smart board, and my, goal, my job at that time was to start training our teachers and training our students to be digital instructional technology trainers. It was very exciting, but yet also um, network back and forth with uh, two schools in Mexico, three schools in Canada, three schools in the United States, including ours, and learn to get to know each other. Very exciting, right? The kids were um, very happy to do that. We didn't have the infrastructure at the time. I will, uh, without boring you, um, uh, on all the details, I took down the microwave and the district network, whole town, one Skype with Calgary, uh, Canada. So we weren't really ready for all of that, but we were practicing, we were trying. But it was Chris McGrath's vision that allowed me to do that, that allowed me to take such a risk. And the culminating event was that I got to take eight of my students it was hard to choose eight, to Calgary, Canada, to now meet all the <coughs> students in classrooms that we were working with over that past year. And they were now master trainers too. So I bring that um, piece around providing opportunities, letting teachers take risks, you know, collaborating with that, but it has to be in the vision of the district leader. That was Chris McGrath who said, and then we built a smart board in every class vision. And we did it. But it's because the district leader sets a, a solid vision and supports the staff. That was a very risky initiative for her back when technology was not what it is today. And I'm forever grateful that I had the opportunity to do that. And I want to be that type of superintendent who provides those opportunities for our kids and our staff. Those students, and you heard from some of those parents uh, last week, um, I changed the life of one of them, and that gentleman told you about that, uh, told you about the time that I really inspired his kiddo, and she was going and 
a different direction, and it was because she had such value. She was teaching her seventh grade teachers how to use the smart board and her eighth grade teachers. It really changed things. So those small efforts can become really big, and we know as a district leader our vision can change lives and certainly can put us on a path of improved instruction, but more than that really just improved opportunities for our students. So I bring that to Tewksbury. I hope um, I've shared with you my skill, my experiences, you know, my 22 years here that have built me to this place. I believe I do possess the skills you need in the next superintendent and the heart to do that work here in Tewksbury. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. We appreciate having you um, at this time. I will. Uh, Announce our future school committee dates, May 5th, 2022, special school committee meeting for deliberations and vote. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Oh, so moved. Second. And we've adjourned now at. I'll take a vote. Oh, all in favor, please say aye. aye.